It is a true honor to be with you all tonight. And I very much thank the organizers and my fellows for helping with my presentation. My presentation tonight is the Oregon Forest Trust from Commodity to Commonwealth. This has been a project of the Conservation Trust Project with our Environmental and Natural Resources Law Center. Oregon has 30 million acres of forest. We are one of the most forested states in America. And yet our forests are among the least protected. This forest provides priceless services that as we will see, I will call Commonwealth. These services cannot be replicated or created by humans. They can only come through forests. They provide carbon storehouses, biodiversity, and watersheds for our drinking water. And yet, since non-Indian settlement, our laws have promoted a commodity frame for these forests. So all of these forests are predominantly managed for timber production and logging. And this is what results when you have a commodity frame pushing the law. My great-grandfather, C.E.S. Wood, wrote an essay in which he advocated for preservation of the ancient forests back in 1908. And he said, he wrote, there's no spot where the primeval forest is assured from the attack of that worst of all microbes, the dollar. And yet, since that time, we've had so many environmental laws managing our forests. But they all operate within the frame of statutory law, which itself is a commodity frame. And this is what those laws have perpetuated, legalized, and promoted across the state. Now, Oregonians get very discouraged when they encounter these laws because less than 10% of Oregon forests are protected at the highest level. And when Oregonians try over and over and over again to secure protection using these laws, they can't understand why the logic of conservation, especially during the time we live in, does not get through. Well, sometimes entrenched approaches are eclipsed by reality. And that is our situation now. It is a huge crisis and a huge opportunity. Indigenous communities across the world share a principle that they call natural law. And this is uh, the quote that I refer to most often in describing it from Oren Lyons. The thing you have to understand about nature and natural laws, there's no mercy, there's only law. And if you don't understand that law and you don't abide by that law, you will suffer the consequence. And so nature's laws are supreme but for 50 years, we've had environmental statutes that includes forest management statutes on the book, which are veering dangerously away from the reality of our moment to the extent that they may not even be relevant in meeting the reality of our moment. So it comes a time where we have to match our laws with our new reality, which is framed by climate emergency. The climate emergency is obvious to us in Oregon. We've suffered devastating mega wildfires. The oceans are becoming 30% more acidic than before the Industrial Revolution, killing fish and oyster farms. The fish in the cold streams may not be able to survive because those streams are heating. And there have been fish kills, dreadful fish kills, even in the past 10 years. Heat domes and heat waves. If we continue this business as usual, the scientists tell us that our world will heat 11 degrees over pre-industrial temperatures by the end of the century. That, in a word, is not survivable. It's not broadly survivable by, survivable by humans. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals expressed it this way in a case decided two years ago, the Juliana appeal, they said, we're on the eve of destruction. It's right there in the federal case. James Speth, who was formerly the Yale Dean of the School of Forestry, wrote in his book, Bridge at the Edge of the World, 
If we keep doing exactly what we are doing today, the world in the latter part of the century won't be fit to live in. I did a little math and you can too. The latter part of the century starts in 2050, which is 28 years from now. So a baby born today will be facing this at about the age of my average law student. We live in a climate emergency. That is to say, the circumstances we face demand a very urgent response, mind-blowing response. And why is that? Why can't we just take decades to address this? Because of dangerous feedback loops that are part of nature's laws, nature's operations. There are tipping points beyond which we would experience runway heating. Because if we push the earth too far into heating, it will engage these feedback loops, which will then release more and more carbon dioxide and methane to the atmosphere. And I can't go into great detail, and most of you know this uh, perhaps anyway, but the greatest, um, the easiest example to explain is the melting permafrost across the northern latitudes. That permafrost holds immense amounts of carbon dioxide and methane. And it's starting to melt because of our heating planet. And if it really melts, um, it will cause so much carbon dioxide and methane. It would swamp the atmosphere way beyond our control to pull it back. And so the UN chief has declared a climate emergency and says the world must act rapidly to prevent this runaway climate change that we can't control. The highest possible safe level of carbon dioxide, according to science, is 350 parts per million. We are at 416 and rising. And so that gap between the two explains why we're seeing all these mega fires and droughts and floods and hurricanes. We've already gone beyond the safe point. So what does nature, what does the planet require from us? A two-part response. One is decarbonization. That means we have to stop emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In fact, we have to have such a cut that we achieve 45% by 2030. That's um, about seven years and three months from now. So we have to slash our carbon dioxide emissions. And then we also have to achieve full decarbonization by 2050. The drawdown side is the other side of this, which means we need to clean up that legacy carbon is so dangerous that is causing all of the effects we're seeing now. Um, that legacy carbon amounts to 150 gigatons that we have to clean up. And we don't have some magic vacuum cleaner to do that. We do have natural climate solutions, and that is deploying the processes of nature itself to scrub the sky and engage a sky cleanup, so to speak. Now, forests are part of both sides of the problem and the solution. Forests, when cut, uh, emit huge amounts of carbon because forests absorb carbon dioxide when they're living. So when they're cut, they emit carbon dioxide. When they stay living, they retain carbon dioxide and they store more as they continue to live. And so they scrub the sky of carbon dioxide. So when we think of the climate crisis, we, we, of course, think of the coal plants and the cars and so forth, but we must think of clear cuts and forest harvest because those result in carbon dioxide emissions just as burning of fossil fuels do. But we must also consider forest part of the solution because we don't have any technological solution that will get us out of this mess anytime soon. Maybe some will be developed in the future, but right now we only have nature's engines. And so when we think of cleaning up the sky, we must think of our forests as drawing down that carbon dioxide and storing it. Now, not all forests are created equal. We here in Oregon and then Washington as well, the west side forests are these incredible forests that store significantly higher amounts of carbon dioxide than most forests around the world. They are some of the most carbon dense forests on the planet. And so I like to call our forest the Amazon forest of North America. Well, beyond the climate crisis, we also have another crisis which also threatens our survival on Earth, which is the biodiversity crisis. We have literally triggered the sixth major extinction on the planet. And for this, the leading scientists and world governments, uh, national governments around the world, 
have committed to a program of conserving 30% of the land, 30% of our waters by 2030. That's a very ambitious program, but it is an effort to try to save enough species to try to, to thwart an all out uh, extinction crisis. So we face this reality and yet our laws operate as if we were 50 years back, at least. Our laws are applicable on federal, state, local, forest, private forests, but they are all perpetuating a commodity frame of forest management, all of them. And so when forest advocates try to stop a forest sale, they necessarily right now are working within these laws. But Albert Einstein said very famously, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. So when you have laws geared towards perpetuating a commodity frame, it is very difficult to save a whole lot of Commonwealth. But there is another uh, Commonwealth thread in our political culture of Oregon. Back in 1910, the Oregon Conservation Commission wrote a report in which it said, and I love this expression of, of Commonwealth, Oregon's forests are her most important resource. Forest wealth is community wealth. Oregon's forests are the assets of all its citizens. The lumberman may move his business, but the people as a whole have a stake in forest preservation that is unalienable and paramount. The question is not of personal property, but one of a community resource. So this commonwealth view exists, and it exists to value forests for their multiple functions ecologically, carbon storehouses, drinking watersheds, biodiversity. But to do, to actually bring this about, we have to reframe the law. Reframing means we create a new paradigm for the law to operate in. We don't necessarily throw away the old laws, but we create a new paradigm to bring logic to the management of our forests. So at the University of Oregon Law School, our conservation trust project set out to bring a public trust analysis to Oregon forest management. And we've produced an article, The Oregon Forest Trust, an Ecological Endowment for Posterity, that will be published as a special edition in the spring of 2023. And we hope to have a white paper summarizing this article in the next couple of months, which we will post online. The public trust principle is a commonwealth protective principle, and it dates back, its roots date back, to Roman law, back to the Institutes of Justinian, which declared that certain things are beyond private property. Certain things must be reserved to the community as a whole, and those include the air, the running waters, and sea. And courts today continue to cite the Institutes of Justinian because those principles became part of the architecture of nearly every nation on earth. In fact, it's so pervasive, as in every state in this country, that my colleague Gerald Torres calls this the law's DNA. So we're not thinking up something new here. We are tapping something very old that simply has not been the center of resource management. In our book um, uh, on public trust law, our textbook, Professor Blum and I really underscored the approach of courts that this public trust principle is an attribute of sovereignty. It does predate the constitution and it is part of the architecture of government itself. In fact, one court, uh, one federal district court in Massachusetts said, you can't shed the public trust doctrine. No legislature can shed it. The only way it can be destroyed is to destroy the sovereign itself. And so here's the premise of the public trust. The public trust says that there are certain ecological resources, natural resources, that are so vital to society that they are kept in a trust for all future generations. In other words, they're beyond complete privatization. And government, as the only enduring institution across society, because generations live and die, government is a trustee to ensure that this wealth maintains in, in its integral state for future generations. So you can almost imagine it as a bank account 
A bank account having money in it would be managed by a trustee, the bank. Well, this is a bank account with incredible wealth, priceless, incalculable wealth, and government is managing it. And it's managing it for our benefit, the citizens of this country and this state. This is our only survival account. And so it better be managed well. So to back up a bit, let's put this in the spectrum of property. Property has two forms, not just one. Most people think of private property, but actually the supreme property interest, the antecedent interest is public property rights held in certain crucial natural resources. So we'll get to what resources those are in a minute. And then of course, there's private property rights that some people hold. But when the two conflict, courts normally say the public trust rights are supreme. So this principle can break out in several elements, three elements to make it really uh, streamlined for you. First, government is the trustee of our crucial natural resources. The crucial natural resources are considered the wealth of the trust, or it's called the rest of the trust. Present and future generations are beneficiaries. We own these resources. Government doesn't own them. Government is the trustee of them. The people own the resources. And government as trustee must protect these for the future generations, as well as for the present generations. It's an enduring trust meant to endure in perpetuity. And so what we did in our legal analysis was we looked at the forest lands of Oregon comprehensively, and we began to call this the Oregon Forest Trust, even though in, in reality, these uh, forests are divided into three ownerships. But wherever located, they are the Oregon Forest Trust. And the ownerships break out into this. Um, public ownership is about 64%, and that's federal and state combined. Private ownership comprises 34%, 10 million acres of forest land. Now of that, 7 million acres are, are uh, managed as corporate industrial forests. And those are the ones we really focused attention on. There are 3 million acres in small woodlot uh, status owned by families and small owners. And those tend to be managed much more sustainably. There are also tribal forests. We didn't focus on those because public trust does not apply to tribes, it applies to the states and the federal government. However, notably, the tribes uh, were the Aboriginal owners and managers of all of this land. And so they have expertise, they also have tribal treaty rights and are beneficiaries of the Indian trust obligation, all of which pertains to the subjects we're talking about tonight, but I won't go into those tonight. So who are the trustees? Well, the trustees are agencies and entities and lawmakers in government. They include legislative bodies, executive branch heads, governor, but only those agencies that deal with natural resources. And so many of our agencies in government don't have anything to do with natural resources, the Social Security Administration, for example. Those agencies are not public trust agencies. And so if you think about all of government, you should think about the fact that there are some agencies in government that have this heightened responsibility to the public. And those are the public trust agencies. Any leader, legislature, or agency that deals with public trust resources. And so a few of these are right up here, um, but there's many more. So there are really two frames that I've been talking about and two frames of the law that, that bear upon forest management. One is the political statutory frame. And I call this a political frame because statutes leave enormous discretion to the lawmakers and also the agencies to decide how to manage forests. They get to make many, many choices within these very broad uh, laws that we have on the books. When you have a, a, a lot of discretion, what tends to happen is that politics tries to move that discretion around. And so big industries try very hard to get their way with legislatures or the agencies. And not surprisingly, in Oregon, the Oregon timber industry is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful in the state. 
And so we see that timber industry constantly driving the commodity frame. The counter frame is the sovereign trust obligation inherent in the public trust. And that focuses not on discretion, but on obligation to the citizens. So let's position this all together. Forest statutory law is encompassed in these laws that you've all heard about, the Endangered Species Act and the National Forest Management Act and, and uh, the Forest Practices Act and so forth. But you can think of those as encircled, if you will, by a higher law, a more supreme law of the public trust. The public trust has constitutional force, according to many courts. And it's been viewed as an attribute of sovereignty, which means that the legislature itself cannot abdicate it. As it pertains to statutes, courts have said public trust obligations are completely separate from statutes. So if you meet the requirements of a statute, that doesn't mean you meet the requirements of the public trust. The public trust is at all times considered the outer boundaries of permissible government action. So where do these rights originate? The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania issued a landmark opinion that overturned a law that promoted fracking. And they said, the Supreme Court justices there said that the public trust rights of the citizens of that state really originate in Article I of that state's constitution, which reserves rights to citizens against their government. Well, Oregon has the same constitutional provision, um, not word for word, but the thrust is, is absolutely the same of the people reserving rights. The Pennsylvania court said, public trust rights are inherent, indefeasible, and inviolate with constitutional force. And so what is the logic behind this doctrine. It's not popular in tyrannies. It comes twin born with democracy. The public trust logic is this, that people empower the government, not the reverse. We give power to our government. And the people would never give power to the government to destroy or monopolize resources critical to their survival and well-being. And so they reserve back the property rights to these resources, so the government cannot fully privatize them. The Illinois Central case decided in 1890 was the landmark case that really articulated this in a way um, that's been repeated over and over again. And there, the US Supreme Court saw a situation they really never encountered before. The Illinois legislature had conveyed the shoreline of Lake Michigan and Chicago to a private railroad company. And this was shoreline that the citizens needed for fishing and navigation commerce and so forth. And the court said, no, it cannot be conveyed to a private railroad company. The legislature literally doesn't have that power because the shoreline was held in trust. And conveyance of the shoreline would be a grievance, which could never be lawn borne by free people. In fact, it said it would not be listened to that the control and management of the harbor of that great city a subject of concern to the whole people of the state should be placed into the hands of a private corporation. Joseph Sachs, um, who is uh, the, the main scholar really of public trust law said, the trust distinguishes a society of serfs from citizens. And so now we get to the question of what resources are in the public trust? What is that rest that is protected by this principle? Well, the defining term is public concern. That was what the Illinois Central case uh, used in defining the shoreline of, of, um, of Lake Michigan to be in the public trust. Well, that resource of public concern definition, that's expanding in most, most places because society evolves over time with new needs and new needs for more resources. And so most courts are expanding that. But always the traditional resources covered in every state in this country, including Oregon, are navigable waters and stream beds and fish and wildlife. And then most courts who have addressed the issue said this is expanding beyond that to include tributaries and groundwater, air, wetlands, forest, minerals, and even in some courts, mind the climate system. This is the doctrine that propelled a global climate movement spearheaded by our children's trust to protect the climate system. Suits against governments um, in states across this country and in 
across the world um, are asserting that the climate system is a public trust asset that the governments have a duty to protect. And that was one of the principles along with the constitutional due process clause that, um, that uh, fueled the Juliana versus the United States case, which is still in the District Court of Oregon right now on a motion um, to amend the complaint. That case was brought on behalf of 21 youth against the US government suing the US government over its entire fossil fuel energy policy. And the youth won a sweeping victory in the District Court of Oregon, whereby the court said, declared a constitutional right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life, saying that that is so fundamental to a free and ordered society. Now, this case inspired cases around the world that um, are, are yielding very, very sweeping victories for uh, youth and for other people who are bringing these cases. However, in Oregon, a parallel case brought on the state level against the state government yielded a very disappointing decision, Cherniak versus Brown. And in that case, the, the uh, Supreme Court of Oregon found a very narrow interpretation of the public trust resources, saying it only applied to stream beds and waters over them, navigable waters and stream beds. And separately in a sort of bizarre, um, a bizarre twist said the public trust doesn't apply to wildlife, but there's a wildlife trust. Uh, no one quite understood that part of the opinion, but, but suffice it to say that there's public trust protection for fish and wildlife, but you have to call it a wildlife trust. The court has said, we do not foreclose that the public trust doctrine may evolve to include more resources in the future. And in fact, Chief Justice Martha Walters wrote a very powerful dissent in which she took that uh, language and said, the time is now, and charted an opinion that could very, very well be a majority opinion someday in the future of the Oregon Supreme Court. Other cases, have issued very strong rulings protecting uh, forests as public trust resources in the Philippines, Uganda, many other, um, many other countries. And perhaps the Philippines' opinion in Aposa uh, versus Factoron about 30 years ago, perhaps that describes the importance of forests most eloquently. That court said, if you cut all our forests, the day would not be too far when all else would be lost, not only for the present generation, but also for those to come. Generations which stand to inherit nothing but parched earth, incapable of sustaining life. And so what lands do the pub public trust protect? Well, let's talk first about the public lands. There's absolutely no question. Forests on public lands are public trust assets, period, because the government has no other way of holding land. So anytime you're on public land, the forests are protected as public trust resources. But what about private forest lands? The acres of concern are the 7 million acres owned uh, by corporations um, and used for industrial forestry. And you can't just eliminate these from the equation. Um, these hold 76% of the forest biomass. And so they also hold enormous habitat. And so we have to deal somehow with those private lands. And the situation of ownership has really pressured um, the owners for more, um, uh, more commodity-driven uh, use of the forest. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. But nevertheless, the public still has an interest in these private lands that's been recognized by the Supreme Court um, since 1907 when the court in Georgia versus Tennessee Copper said, the state has an interest independent and behind the title of its citizens in all the earth and air within its domain. And it has the last word as to whether its forests will be stripped. Well, now the ownership has changed such that we have uh, what are called REITs and TMOs, real estate investment trusts, timber uh, investment management organizations that are very distant uh, entities 
managing these lands in Oregon, and in some cases, a bank um, with interest in these lands. So Oregon has, in effect, on these lands, become kind of a forest ATM for investors and managers that really have no ties to Oregon. And so the push for a commodity-driven set of laws and outcomes is greater now than perhaps ever before because of that. Nevertheless, the basic principle of property law is do no harm. A property owner never has the right to harm uh, public resources or uh, other property owners or communities. Now, the definition of harm, of course, will change as society moves through time. Richard Powell once said, time marches on towards new adjustments between individualism and the social interest. So we must now evaluate harm in the context of the climate emergency, something that was never thought of 50 years ago. Well, on these private lands, the public trust duties of the sovereign still exist, but they are not exercised through management because the um, government doesn't own the lands, public doesn't own the lands, but they're exercised through regulation. So when the government regulates these lands, it has to meet the fiduciary obligations of the public trust. And it has a duty to protect traditional public trust assets like navigable waters, fish, wildlife. Now the Forest Practices Act is the primary law governing these lands. It is um, shockingly permissive. It's been modified by the private forest accord and I'll talk about that momentarily. But the question in this analysis would be, does the Forest Practices Act, as modified by the private forest court, does that meet the obligations of the public trust? So when you look at any privately owned land that is in a watershed through which inevitable water flows, I always tell students and citizens, you know, think about the fact that this is a navigable waterway owned by the public. There may be fisheries, there may be wildlife and look at the practices and see if the practices have some effect, perhaps downstream on that navigable waterway. If so, there is a public trust issue. And Oregon has conveniently put a map up that is interactive showing the navigable waterways of Oregon. And so citizens don't have to do any guesswork anymore as to what's a navigable waterway. Well, the trustee's obligations are to to present and future beneficiaries. So now we're gonna turn a corner and go through these obligations, these fiduciary obligations. And these are part of the trust architecture. You, you can't have a trust without fiduciary obligations. It just doesn't exist. I've compiled these obligations in the public trust uh, arena in my book, Nature's Trust. And what I did was I went to all the leading cases and, of which Oregon's is not a part but all the other leading cases, and I compiled the public trust principles of fiduciary care and put them together. And these are all designed to circumscribe the trustees enormous management over our vital ecology. And again, these fiduciary obligations are carried out through both management of public lands and resources, but also regulation of private lands that may affect trust assets. So I'm going to go through these rather quickly. Of course, there's certainly not time to do a full audit of the, the public trust and, and as juxtaposed against the state's timber uh, regulation and management, but I'll just touch on a few examples that may bring some of these duties to light. There are 10 duties and I will go through them fairly, fairly rapidly here. The first and really most integral is the duty of protection. Well, what does that mean? Courts say the um, government trustee has a duty to prevent substantial impairment. So it's not any impairment, it's substantial impairment. Well, we looked at clear cutting road building, tree plantations and chemical spray. Those are four activities of industrial forestry that cause enormous damage. And we looked at the damage to forests, waters, biodiversity and the atmosphere. And uh, almost invariably, you can see that the substantial impairment stop sign was run a long time ago. Um, certainly, you can't clear cut a forest without substantially impairing the forest. It destroys the forest altogether. But it also causes, um, cumulatively, of course, substantial impairment to the atmosphere. In fact, the timber industry in this state is the largest source of Oregon's emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. 
and much of that carbon dioxide will remain in the atmosphere and then becomes part of what has to be cleaned up. There's also substantial impairment to community drinking water supplies. And how does this happen? It's because um, many of the community's drinking water supplies actually rely on private forest lands. But these are the highest quality, the most sustainable sources of water on Earth. And most Oregonians rely on these forested watersheds. So this is what a privately owned forested watershed looked like back in 2004. This is the Jetty Creek watershed that supplies Rockaway Beach. And this is what it looked like in 2013 with absolutely devastating impacts to that community's water system. And this was Corbett, Oregon, same thing, privately owned watershed, the community relied on it for its water source when it was clear cut, had devastating impacts. There's also the matter of chemical contamination of drinking water sheds. The timber corporations spray their lands with pesticides and, and um, herbicides, hundreds of thousands of pounds dumped on private forest lands each year. And these, of course, accumulate in the watershed and they show up in waterways. Now, this practice has been altogether banned on federal forest lands, but it has not yet been banned on private forest lands. And so as there's that qualitative um, impairment, but then we also get to just a matter of quantity. The uh, practices of clear cuts and then planting tree plantations have been shown to affect stream flow, greatly diminishing it, perhaps up to 50%, um, a 50% drop when you compare the tree plantations to the old growth forest. There's harm to biodiversity. We all know about this because of all the Endangered Species Act lawsuits. Um, and so I won't, won't go into that. Now, the private forest accord was a compromise arrived at between environmental leaders and groups and the private timber industry. And it basically um, was, was, was pushed so that the private industry could get a habitat conservation plan and incidental take permit under the Endangered Species Act um, to allow practices to go forward. Now this resulted in some improvement and resulted in uh, buffers that still have to be signed into law and, and amend the Forest Practices Act. It established buffers for some of the um, species, for the streams, but it in no way actually protects forest ecology against substantial impairment. It was a very hard fought battle to get the protections that finally ended up in that private forest accord. But at the end of the day, it is still a compromise that no matter how hard it was to win, um, is within the political frame. And all of that is really irrelevant to nature. The question is, is there a substantial impairment still of a public trust resource? That is the question, no matter how hard fought a compromise is or what it yields in the political frame. The real question is, is there at the end of the day substantial impairment to these public trust resources? The second duty is the duty against waste. And this duty is, is to protect future generations so that they will inherit what the present generation has enjoyed. Um, President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, spoke of this very eloquently when he said, um, you know, we've gotten past the stage when we're to be pardoned if we treat part of our country as something to be skinned for two or three years for the use of the present generation, whether it's the forest, the water, the scenery, whatever it is, handle it so your children's children will get the benefit of it. When we look at intact forests, what we must realize in thinking about the waste principle is that once cut, these, these don't grow back within our lifetime or maybe the lifetime of our grandchildren even. In fact, my great grandfather C.S. Wood wrote that, that essay, uh, man cannot restore it. It cannot be built by nature in less than a thousand years, nor indeed ever, for it is never renewed the same. And so when we see absolute eradication of intact forest, we must think of the waste principle because what that means is depriving the next generation, next, 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 of the resources that that forest used to provide. 
There's then the duty to maximize the value of this ecological wealth to the beneficiaries, that's us and our future generations. And what goes along with that is another duty, the duty against managing a trust asset for the primary benefit of a private party. Now, all of this makes sense. If you think about who owns these resources, the public, and so, of course, the government would have to manage it for the public's benefit, not for the benefit of a private corporation, and also would have to maximize the benefit of it because it's very valuable commonwealth. So the commodity frame just flies in the face of all this. It's usually um, promoting the private benefit of a private party, singular benefit of a private party, and it doesn't maximize the commonwealth at all because when a forest is cut, it stops providing a carbon storehouse of drinking water shed and biodiversity support, much less recreation. The Hawaii Supreme Court said this duty requires a rigorous and affirmative review of trust purposes before you allow any destruction um, of the, the trust asset. Now, I would maintain, since we have incredible carbon storage capability in our west side forests in particular, um, these forests are carbon ready or drawdown of atmospheric carbon. And so I would maintain they have almost a premium that requires even further analysis um, than, than, than standard forests that don't have that ability. Old trees are also exceptional in this regard, no matter where they're located. Mature and old forests continue to accumulate carbon over decades to centuries. And so when an old tree is cut, not only does it emit carbon into the atmosphere, but you're depriving that one engine of sky cleanup um, in a way that, that, that continues, perpetuates the harm to the atmosphere, but also precludes the solution of carbon drawdown. Now, one legal development that happened in the end of the trust, uh, Trump administration was the eliminated, elimination of a very protective rule for old trees on the east side. It's called the east side screens rule which protected old trees that were 21 inch diameter breast height or more from being cut. And the Trump administration um, did away with that rule and the Biden administration has not reinstated that rule. And that is very problematic because these trees, again, are carbon stores. Now, there was a project outside of Bend, Oregon um, just last spring, which I think really demonstrates the uh, lack of fiduciary care when you look at this particular fiduciary duty to maximize the value of the resource. This was um, a proposed cut on the Deschutes National Forest of 30 large ponderosa pine trees right along a recreational trail that was heavily used by the public. And the public organizations actually asked the forest supervisor to pause the sale because they said, even though it was part of a fuels reduction uh, plan from many, many years ago. Today, there's more carbon in these trees you haven't accounted for. And when they're cut, they will release carbon. These are also some of the most fire resistant trees. And that they offer so many benefits to the public, both in carbon drawdown, but also recreation. And the forest supervisor refused to engage in that analysis that is required by a fiduciary, by a trustee, to take a thorough look at the action and maximize the benefits of the public. And that analysis will change over time depending on what circumstances we face. And so all those trees you see were cut and they're gone. They were destroyed. Now, that is not to say that this principle is uh, anti all logging. It's not to say it at all. There's an analysis that has to be made. Sometimes the public will need um, the fruits of, of logging, but that is part of a careful analysis that must be made by the trustee. In this case, none was made. And more often than not, the commodity frame eliminates that analysis entirely, just assuming that commodity values are um, the purpose of force. The fifth duty is the duty to restore the trust when it's been damaged and also to sue the parties that have damaged the trust and recover natural resource damages, that's money damages, and put that money into restoring the trust. So when you see any oil spill, and here is a picture of the BP depurized oil spill, when you hear of an oil spill, um, you can be pretty certain that the state or federal trustees are going to be suing that oil company for damages and put that money into the cleanup of that spill. 
in um, Oregon, actually, there is a suit brought by the uh, special counsel to the attorney general suing Monsanto Corporation over PCB pollution in waterways. And it's a common law natural resource damage suit. It's not, not out of any statute. Um, but these PCBs are evident in fish and wildlife and soils and waters in many, many areas across Oregon. And so Oregon is suing to recover damages to clean that up. And many have asked, what about the timber companies and the damage they might have caused to public trust resources, whether it's uh, air or water, uh, wildlife? What about the damages that they caused? They have reaped $67 billion of value from these forests from logging uh, since 1991. Are they responsible for any sort of remediation for resources they might have damaged? So that is an open question. The sixth duty is the duty of loyalty. And this is a procedural duty designed to keep the trustee, which holds all this power over the wealth, designed to keep the trustee from acting in their own self-interest. Because we know that if the trustee has all this control, but, but, but is biased, they will use the wealth to promote their own interests. And so this duty has made its way into public trust jurisprudence. And the duty is basically to eliminate sources of temptation. Well, the biggest source of temptation for government trustees is in campaign contributions. Because here's the dynamic, and we all know it, when industries or, or private uh, you know, profiteers uh, want something uh, to go their way in government, whether it's a management decision or whether it's a regulation, they will often contribute large sums of money to the campaign of the government official who will have authority over that decision. Well, if the government official doesn't do what they want, of course, the money will dry up in the next campaign. So this is just geared, it's, it's, it's actually designed to create bias in the system. And in Oregon, perhaps it doesn't come as a surprise that Rob Davison's expose on this dynamic found that per capita, per lawmaker, timber interests gave more in winning candidates in Oregon than anywhere in the nation. He also found, and this is his um, reporting perfectly legal, the clear cut rewards of campaign cash, that these corporate donations uh, promoted what is thought to be a very easy regulatory climate where industry gets what it wants and the public struggles to be heard. And so back to the duty of loyalty, what that would mean is that the acceptance of a campaign contribution by an entity that has an interest in the matter, and we're just limiting this to the public trust, of course, not to overall business or education decisions or anything else, but the acceptance of that money where there's um, a business stake is itself a violation of that duty of loyalty. The next duty is the duty to adequately supervise and monitor trust property. We, we know that these trustees have enormous control over the property, so they better be supervising it. Um, we looked at aerial spraying in particular because private timber corporations carry out over 7,000 chemical applications on a million acres a year. And while there is a notice requirement under the new spray legislation, um, there, there's really not active on the ground monitoring of, of these uh, spray events. In fact, there's way too many to monitor. And so that we found was a problem. The duty of caution is another duty that you would expect of trustees to not risk um, the full wealth of the asset and risky investments. We looked also at aerial spraying with that. Um, in particular, the precautionary approach is used whenever toxins are involved. Um, and so the fact that these chemicals include an ingredient in Agent Orange, and we don't know really how they affect humans, how they affect the environment, that is all in the zone of the precautionary approach. The fiduciaries have to take caution when managing these uh, vital resources. The ninth duty is the duty of reasonable skill and prudence. This just makes sense that the trustee has so much power over this wealth, they better bring basic skill and prudence when managing it. Um, in this regard, we looked at the uh, trustee's fire prevention policies, which increasingly focus on thinning forests to prevent wildfires. Um, the Biden administration has released a, a, a plan to thin across 
acres of federal, state, and private land in an effort to prevent fires. But the emerging science really questions whether such a broad scale strategy is prudent. And we questioned it as well. Um, in fact, some scientists point out that the likelihood of a thin dairy actually encountering a fire is relatively low. And they recommend a strategy of protect from the home out rather than try to thin the whole forest coming in. Another concern is that when you thin forests, oftentimes the contractors will want to thin the biggest trees for their commercial value. Those are the trees that tend to be more fire resistant because they're thick bark, high canopies. And these are the trees also that store so much carbon. So you're releasing carbon as you're thinning them. And some scientists say you're actually releasing more than a fire would release had it burned those trees. So all of that is to say that um, thinning may be um, absolutely warranted in certain circumstances, but a broad scale approach seems to defy the, um, the uh, fiduciary duty of prudent management. The elemental titled film, uh, which uh, is, um, uh, I believe it's been released, if not, it will be soon, features um, scientists that look at the fire management approaches. I highly recommend this film. It's a wonderful film to take a probing look at the fire crisis and fire management. And the final duty, and we're going to be wrapping up, is the duty of furnishing information to the beneficiaries. You know, if you put um, your savings into a bank account, you expect that the bank account will give you a statement online or in the mail every month. And you look at that statement, or you could look at that statement, and you know whether or not there's losses, what the bank, if it's an investment account, what the uh, bank has done to invest your funds. And so you can kind of keep track and monitor that trustee. That only makes sense. Well, the same principle holds true with ecological wealth. And we were troubled by the fact uh, that records of forest practices and chemical spray events in Oregon are not kept beyond five to seven years. Um, because if you don't keep that kind of information, for one, you can't furnish it to the beneficiaries, but for another, you can't track overall trends in ecology over time. It is very important to keep records of these forest practices for a much longer period. And so what we have done was we have uh, taken a tour, if you will, through the public trust fiduciary duties incumbent on uh, sovereign trustees. Those are legislators, people in agencies, anyone dealing with our force. I'm going to take a moment to turn on a light in our room because it has gotten dark outside and the natural light is gone. And so let me conclude with some, some very broad thoughts here. Oregon and, and some states around the country are very uh, fast moving towards a decarbonized system, system reform uh, in transportation and energy and so forth to thwart these, um, the climate emergency. But we cannot really think about system reform unless we also think about forest reform because it is part of the problem of pollution and also part of the solution if they're left standing. And so our team put together what we call pillars of reform to just guide thinking on what would a commonwealth um, approach look like. And the, the first really central one is to establish broad forest reserves. Dr. Beverly Law of Oregon State University and a team of scientists established a very precise methodology for identifying across the Western states, but also in Oregon in particular, identifying those most valuable trees for carbon storehouses that are also most valuable for biodiversity um, and that are fire resistant. And so with this methodology, you can actually map out logical uh, forest reserves in Oregon. Protecting older trees is crucial. Uh, outside of the reserves, because these older trees, as I said, store immense carbon. So if they're cut, they're releasing that carbon, but also they're going to keep cleaning carbon out of the sky. They provide biodiversity benefits as well. And so the 21 inch rule, very problematic that that's off the books. It's been on the books for a very long time. Um, protect drinking water sheds from logging and spraying. 
The Bull Run watershed, which provides uh, Portland's water supply, is fully protected. Of course, that's on federal land, but wherever located, it is quite important to protect drinking watersheds, um, if they're on private lands or public lands, from logging and spraying. And that is really an outgrowth of the do no harm rule, I think, um, of, of prop basic property law. The state has, up until now, really treated drinking water as sort of a throwaway resource. And yet it's quite the opposite. It's very irreplaceable. Uh, drinking water is going to become even more rare in our climate circumstance in the future. Shift property expectations on corporate industrial lands and extend rotations, timber rotations on those lands. Um, already expectations have shifted because of the new sort of TMOs and REITs and banks that own these lands. So there may be a, a real opportunity to just shift uh, expectations altogether. And that may go hand in hand with exploring natural resource damages from past industrial logging. And then finally, instilling fiduciary obligations in federal, state, and, and uh, county trustees. Now, most people working in the uh, agencies and the legislators themselves, they don't pay attention to the public trust. Maybe they haven't heard of it, or maybe they have heard of it, but it just hasn't been crystallized for them. And so we need to instill this because it is one of their constitutional duties towards the people of the state of Oregon. And so to summarize these points, we are the living beneficiaries of a priceless trust. And this trust holds the waters, the air, the wildlife, the forest, the soils, and all that encompasses the web of life. Our ancestors drew their life from this trust, and so will our descendants. This trust, exquisitely balanced, spectacularly complex, supports all life systems. And our ancestors knew this. They knew that without this trust, life will not persist. That is law. That is nature's law. Yet our commodity laws launch this by legalizing massive forest destruction, and along with it, incalculable harm to our waters, fisheries, wildlife, and the climate system. And so when you hear the strongest possible warnings from scientists that our continued fossil fuel emissions and deforestation will threaten civilization and our children's very survival on this planet, you know that fate has delivered all of us today in an unbelievable moment in human history. As many now recognize, our living generation is the first to truly understand the threat of runaway climate change and the last equipped to stop it. So why do we now focus on our inalienable rights? Because never before in the history of this nation has our fundamental ecology been so ferociously and ignorantly destroyed, and with such dire consequences for young people. Looking back, we see these rights surfacing at epic times throughout human history. These principles stand no less revolutionary for our time than the forcing of the Magna Carta on the English monarchy or Gandhi's great salt march to the sea. What we must realize is that we too are living during an epic time in history. And with crisis, comes the rare opportunity to rethink how we live on this earth for the coming centuries and to listen to tribal elders whose ancestors tended forests across this region for millennia. In this moment, yes, Oregonians must anchor into whatever protection existing laws give to conserve as much as possible, but we must also look ahead of the laws for if the people continue to speak only from the context of narrow statutes designed to protect commodity use of the forest, the moral run of ecological annihilation will never agonize the decision makers and the political power of distant corporate interests will continue to drive state policy towards ecological bankruptcy. Thinking of the Supreme Court justices who penned that Illinois Central opinion back in 1890 saying, it would not be listened to that the Chicago shoreline would be placed in the hands of a private corporation. You can practically hear those justices saying today, it would not be listened to 
that our lawmakers here and elsewhere would let distant timber corporations and banks and REITs and TMOs raise our forests, contaminate our watersheds, release massive amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, push our species into the sixth major extinction this planet has ever known, all threatening our children's future and the habitability of the nation it would not be listened to. Just as preceding generations did, we too must hold government accountable as trustees of our commonwealth. We need a whole new set of instructions for our government actors. The public trust represents the very antithesis of the discussion model that has spread so much corruption in statutory law. This is a full paradigm shift formed around the expectations of accountability to the people. And these are rights we still hold, rights we can assert. They are among the constitutional rights that 11 young people of this state, along with 10 others across the country, used to gain a declaration by the Federal District Court of Oregon of the right to a stable climate system supporting life across Earth. But this principle is not just for the courtroom. The same trust principles that flow through a judge's pen can be taken to the legislature, the agencies, the media, the businesses, the schools, and all organizations of society. It can be preached from a pulpit or spoken as the last words from a grandmother to her grandchildren anywhere in the world because the trust encompasses a moral instruction to protect our children's rightful legacy. So surely there must come a time in Oregon when the great cathedrals of primordial forests will be assured from the attack of the worst of all microbes, the dollar. And just as it may not make any sense anymore for fossil fuels to be extracted, giving rise to an entire movement to keep it in the ground, the time seems right for a movement to keep our forests in the ground. When the governors, state legislators, state land board, county commissioners, and officials all across the Oregon Department of Forestry, US Forest Service, and BLM and other agencies embrace their fundamental duties as co-trustees towards the state's forest endowment, then they will use their authority to rebuild natural wealth in Oregon towards restoration, abundance, resilience, and justice. But that day cannot come soon enough for the children of Oregon and children around the world who must inherit a planetary life system now teetering on the brink of collapse. And intergenerational justice will only become part of the political culture if the people voice their rights. Oregonians love their forests, our forests. And they show up at hearings and testify by, before the state legislature, sit in trees, make documentary films, circulate petitions, boycott rapacious corporate practices, teach their children about their rightful forest legacy. And it stays in every way tied to our future survival as humanity. Together, the citizens and leaders of Oregon must plant a stake in history and reclaim their rightful trust for all of posterity. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Mary. Um, so tonight we're not opening up for question and answer. Uh, we just have one question that as a group we kind of came up with um, to ask you and honestly I feel like you answered it <laughs> but maybe this will trigger one more little answer um, so how might we use the public trust doctrine to save our forests and I want to add maybe locally what did you add locally is that what you said yeah um and what did you mean by locally you mean just in your own backyard sort of yeah you know, like county? how my how my individual people um you know, employ the public trust doctrine? I think it's very important for people first to understand the very practical fiduciary obligations. And that's why I went through each one of them. Um, they will be detailed in our, in our law review article and in the white paper. And so these obligations just form the logic of what we expect our government to do. It is absolutely ingrained in our democracy to think 
of the ideal of government doing all these things. And so we know these, but I think um, individuals have to voice these fiduciary obligations because they really don't voice them in the context of statutory laws. Individuals can continue, of course, to use the statutes for whatever protections they can get. But it's important to bring the public trust to the agencies, to the broader public, to the press, um, and, and to the legislators. And identify, this is what you're supposed to be doing. It is our constitutional right that you do it. And so by voicing the public trust, you actually start changing the political culture. Right now, it is a commodity culture. But what we are looking at is changing from a political commodity culture to a fiduciary culture. And that will only happen if people all over the state voice this public trust responsibility in the most logical terms. And I would also say that we must all look ahead of the law as it stands today. Um, again, when we are caught in the moment, we fail to see the opportunity that all these crises are bringing to us. And we have to meet those opportunities for our very survival and for the survival and prosperity of, of young people. And so by looking ahead of the law, we envision how our government should be and we express that. Um, the public trust operates outside the courtroom. Abe Lincoln uh, was famous to have said that with public sentiment, nothing can fail. Um, without it, nothing can succeed. And so it's a matter of spreading this logic around um, and knowing that lawsuits are only a very small part of the um, democracy that must thrive on the public trust.